Um, thanks uh, for those of you who are already on the call. And uh, yeah, just wanted to say welcome to tonight's webinar. Uh, my name is Ryan Henry. I'm a former professional um, tennis player and co-founder of uh, Voyager Tennis, uh, along with uh, Luke as well, who's on the call. Luke's also a uh, former professional player, spent uh, several years actually working with uh, Roger Federer, um, uh, with a, with a, both had the same coach of, of Tony Tony Roach for uh, yeah quite a few years there. So a huge amount of experience as a, as a top world-ranked junior, as well as a, a professional player. And, and Luke's just done a, a tour, Tennis Australia tour of um, Europe and visited some of the world's best uh, academies. And so that's what we're going to be talking about tonight. So yeah, welcome to the uh, the call, Luke. Yeah, I appreciate it, Ryan. Um, uh, really looking forward to tonight. Obviously, it was a great experience. Um, but looking forward to the opportunity of doing this with you. I know we've done a few of these uh, recently, and I can't remember that. I think we kicked it off at the very beginning. So I'm really excited to be uh, back on the uh, on the call with you. Definitely, mate. Definitely. Um, uh, guys, so just just a really quick thing as well, just on the, on the webinar etiquette. If if everyone can remain on mute um, throughout tonight, that would be uh, that'd be fantastic. Um, all right, let's uh, let's kick it off. Uh, yeah, so Luke, maybe to start, do you want to just talk us through the the goals and the purpose of the tour from um, Tennis Australia's perspective, who who funded it? Hundred uh, percent. But I, I think to um, Brian, just before we do, um, obviously we want it to be interactive. So if you do have any questions, guys, obviously we'll open up some question time at the end. Um, if you do have any uh, questions, too, happy to. If you want to sort of put it in the, in the chat box down the bottom, and we can can answer it um, if we feel it's appropriate at the time, or we'll come back to it as we have those questions. But um, but right, yeah, right. Coming back to the sort of the goal, the purpose of the tour is um, this. This is a new initiative by Tennis Australia. Um, what they've often done is invested in the player, um, so they have a pretty ambitious goal. Um, something that they're they're really sort of aware of too. And, and the goal is um, it's basically to have thirty top hundred players by twenty thirty two. So by the Olympics, um, Tennis Australia's goal is to have fifteen men and fifteen women in the top hundred, which I, I think is amazing. I think it's a fantastic. Uh, um, as ambition um, and again it's something that, that they're working really strongly on I think for us there's so many Aussies I can see so many names in the room as well which obviously would love that to be you um, and, and so what they're doing is in, in, in rather than investing in the individual what they're looking at is investing in a group of uh, coaches who are really uh, really sort of focused in that high performance space so um, yeah so we've basically the first trip happened last year in September um, they took a select group of coaches through the states um, and again, this year there is a process to be selected. So I was I was really um, really fortunate. I've one or two platinum coaches in the country, and it's based on criteria. So so I had some kids that have done really really well, winning multiple national titles, which qualified in this tour. And and um, yeah, so that that's really um, what the purpose was. So it was led by Scott Draper. Um, some of you remember Scott um, for different reasons, but obviously a great player. Um, also has a really sort of um, expansive um, field of expertise from getting his PGA golf tour card to, again, work with his corporate background at KPMG, um, as well as Belinda Culinary. Belinda's the head of high performance at TA. Um, and we had some great, uh, I guess, guest coaches along the way. But that, that was really what it was about. It's called the Know the Level Tour. So it was really to see the, the level over in Europe and, and the States. But it was amazing. Yeah, nice, nice, mate. Yeah, it's an incredible opportunity to be able to, you know, it's not often, um, and not many, I guess, coaches have the opportunity to, to see what what best practice um, can look like at some of these, you know, the world's best academies, which you've you've been to, um, and even as a player, like you know, it's one of the things that you always want to do as a, as a tennis player is go and see what the what what some of the best look like, and so that's why we encourage our players to do it. But fantastic initiative from Tennis Australia to get their coaches over there to see what some of the best in the world are doing in that space. So, um, mate, talk talk us through the uh, the some of the academies that you visited while you're there. Yes, yeah, so um, again, the three countries to visit was Spain, France, and Italy. Um, and again, it wasn't just the academies. As I said, we had a great sort of group from, that, from Australia, but it was also uh, the first half of it. It was led by Jose Higueras. Um, for those sort of tennis uh, enthusiasts, you'll actually remember Jose. Is, I mean, he's a great player in his own right. He's number six in the world. Um, but as a coach, he's just got one of the literally the greatest CVs um, <laughs> out there. Like he coached. Michael Chang to the French Open Championship at 17 years of age. I think that was his, it was his first, one of his first gigs coaching. Um, again, someone like Jim Curry as well, took Jim from about 16 to water number one. Um, again, a lot of players, Monica Sellers, Lindsay Davenport, I think Sharon Pover as well. Um, but Jose uh, was basically leading it. He's Spanish. Um, again, Jose coached Roger Federer to winning the French Open. So Roger brought him on for that. And then he then, since after working with Roger, he took over the USTA. It's actually a big reason for the USTA's success right now. But with, with uh, Jose and Mark Kovacs, one of the lead, leading sort of sports biomechanics, uh, we visited um, in Spain. We went to Real Tennis Club in Barcelona, which is, again, it's got an extensive history for home of the Barcelona Open. 
He went to BTT, uh, which, which is led by Francis Roy. Uh, Francis coached for Rathbun Adal for 18 years. Um, we also got to visit as a crossover. We actually went to FC Barcelona, so to see the Barcelona Football Club with Lionel Messi, some of the, some of the greats. We actually got to see the inner work of uh, Football Academy as well. Um, again, across the Nadals, uh, which was a great experience, as well as Emilio Sanchez Academy. And it was interesting, Ryan, because obviously visiting Sanchez, I know you did that as part of the PA tour uh, back in the day, because one of your students was actually one of the coaches on that tour. Um, but yeah, it was, it, was, it was a great opportunity through Spain. Uh, in France, we went to Montpellier, um, in Italy, uh, to me, which was super impressive. We went through uh, the Ricardo Piazzi uh, Academy and Ricardo's, uh, again, one of, one of the most amazing coaches to produce players like Yannick Sinner and Ivan uh, as well as working with so many different players. Um, but a key thing that I really loved too was uh, we actually visited the J500 ITF tournament in Milan. So I'm not sure if, uh, if you remember that one, right? But I was there 28 years ago as the leading junior tournament on, on the TA Tour uh, to lead to the French Open. Do you remember playing it? No, no. They when I when I played in it, uh, which would have been yeah, probably seven or eight years later. That the lead up tournament was in uh, uh, was in a different country. Um, uh, I'm just trying to think. Oh, uh, Belgium. Belgium. Uh, it was Charlotte yeah, yeah. This, it moved, this is the yeah. tour before. Yep. It. Yeah. So, but I'm sure you wouldn't play this one because it's been there for actually over 50 years. And uh, I mean, even some of the players, the Federers, I mean, you, all these players that were, were great players. Um, it was great to see see that that level. Um, we actually saw. Young uh, Pablo Menendez, he's actually captured the world number one ranking, uh, winning his quarterfinal match there. I mean, some of the players were just fantastic. And the last stop was in, in Rome. We went to the Italian Federation. The Italian Federation now is actually one of the most reputable uh, sort of federations producing players, uh, particularly on the male side. So it was just a, a great opportunity to see from academies to tournaments to, to again, federations and just to hear and, and trying to sort of pick up bits and pieces um, from, from all over, all over Europe. Yeah, nice, mate. Nice. Uh, that's uh, that's good. Yeah, in the in the lead up tournament when I was there, I think we only had one before the French Open because the uh, the coaches knew no matter how many uh, lead up tournaments on clay you played before <laughs> the French, you're still still not going to uh, fare against the uh, Europeans and the South Americans. But but uh, yeah, anyway, besides besides the point there. But um, no, yeah, I, guess, I actually uh, I actually think that's a really interesting point. I actually think that's a really interesting point. I know someone's already asked me a question on those lines, but I think it's actually a really good point um, in in what you make. But maybe we'll come back to that. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Um, yeah, mate. So obviously, some of the some of the big academies there, uh, some of the, the the most well known ones in the world there. What it, what were some of the key learnings, I guess, or things you you got out of it? Uh, I mean, to me, really, the first one was uh, I think there's a reason why Australia does so well. I mean, for such a small population, in Europe, there's so many populations, like so many countries that are so closely located, and you just see to me what what I was so impressed with was the amount of people that are fully committed, like absolutely all in on their tennis. Uh, and again, I know we still we still to see a few here, but to me, tennis was the center of their lives. See how everything else orbited that. And that, that was one of the things that I saw here is probably there's there's key reasons why we are so good, why we've actually produced so many players. Um, and again, a lot of our development practices, because that was one of the things, the first thing was actually again, same as the States, I was actually really happy seeing what we deliver in our method and our methodology and what we're sort of doing at our academy. Um, but but yeah, it was just it was really that commitment level was probably the first thing that jumped out at me because I know it's probably one of the hard things we see here is how people are juggling so many different things from school and family and friends. That was, for me, a huge key part. Also, too, what really blew me away is no matter where we went from, again, to literally even Rio, uh, the tennis club in Barcelona. And, I mean, they were, they were literally having it cracked too. They're, 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 they have a Tommy Robredo, who a lot of you remember. Tommy was basically a, um, a guest coach that comes in monthly. The first thing they talked to was actually the US College Pathway. And whether it was Nadal's, whether it was Moritobu, whether it was the Italian Federation, they actually spoke to that and they spoke to it so highly. They're obviously talking about, to me, again, I know that's a big driver, a big sort of pathway for us, but across the board, that was, that was one of the things that so many of their coaches, so many of their players were actually looking towards. And, and I think that was, to me, I was sort of a little bit surprised in that sense. I, I, I thought I was going to see more kids, you know what, I'm going pro, I'm going early, I'm going hard. I'm really going to back myself and have a crack, but that 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 again was sort of um, really 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 critical. Like I I just I I was really surprised um, in in what they were sort of looking for. But but again that 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 key thing there, you just saw so many kids that were actually fully on board, knew what the vision was, obviously knew the mindset that was required, and and just all their behaviours revolved around. It was actually really really impressive. And, and so I guess with that focus being college, being the, the number one goal of a lot of the academies, getting players to 
enhance their education um, at a US college. Um, I'm assuming the education side is, is uh, uh, what, what sort of combinations, I guess, did you see? Did you see a lot of distance education or a lot of like academies with schools linked in? It, yeah, a, a bit of both, in all honesty. I mean, some some of them you could see, like one of the academies in Spain, um, their program was was pretty interesting. Like they went from eight to nine in the morning in sort of gym, a lot of the sort of activation work took to get before getting on court. Then from nine to 12 was a combination of tennis and gym. Then they had lunch, like a nice lunch break from 12 to 1.30, and then they're back on court for sort of an hour and a half um, in the afternoon um, with the typical sort of point play situations that you see. And then for me, it was quite interesting that their school went from 4, 4.30 to 7.45 at night. I, mean, I think that was an extreme in what we saw and in, in what they were doing. But but a lot of the, um, again, the Dals had a different model where to me there was kids doing different things. So a lot of the school kids only hit once. Um, so, so some of the kids that had, had sort of more of a performance mindset were hitting a couple of times a day that school revolved around it. But yeah, it was it was a mixture of, again, a lot of distance education, um, a lot of, uh, again, schools that worked around their tennis. Yep. Um, yep. Yeah, gotcha. Gotcha. And um obviously one of the main benefits of, of, you know, some varying education setups is that, you know, players can in, increase the training, the training volumes and match play volumes, which we know from all our research um, that they are you know, the fundamentals for being a great player. You know, the, the 10,000 hour rule a hundred percent applies for, for tennis and the more matches players play, the better match play they become. So what, what are some of the, I guess, the volumes that you typically saw at a lot of those academies that players are getting in terms of both training and competition? Yeah, well, I think, um, again, because Senate was, to me, time wasn't really a, a challenge. And for me, being in Sydney, I think it's one of our biggest challenges how people are so time poor. Um, that, that, was, that was one of the things there. But again, we were sort of seeing 12 to 12 year olds, sort of about 15 plus hours a week on court, probably 15 to 18 hours. And again, I think that's something there that not something they just jump to. I mean, we talk about progressive overload and how the kids are working towards that and gradually building to those processes. Um, to, so building up to that level where they can maintain it without having too many sort of injury overloads. Um, but yeah, it was it was re- literally most kids were sort of that 15 hours and up um, from what I saw. But the key thing was it was actually the time they spent the bodies. To me, that was one of the things that I think minimum kids are spending 10 to 12 hours a week on their on their preparation of their bodies, obviously their prehab, uh, making sure that they're doing a lot of lot of development work, making sure they have the right movement patterns. Um, that was that was, and again, that was really key to see, uh, clear to see. And um, from a training sort of a match play volume, it really really depended. Because again, I'm saying college. I'm, I'm not saying that college was their primary focus. A lot of kids, obviously, they wanted to play professionally, but there was there was actually a, a realistic understanding that hey, unless I'm sort of tracking as that outlier, where I'm sort of by 400 ATP or WTA by my 18th birth year, um, that that's where I'm, I'm, I'm basically going down that path. But um, but yeah, yeah the, using the, I guess I guess it push, a lot of players are pursuing the pro circuit via college essentially. Correct. Is is what yeah. you're saying? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like we, I saw this young girl, Clovey Nagui from um, from Maryland in the states. Like she was she was a gun. She was 16. She's already 530 WTA, so she's top five in the world. And just watching her play, I mean, you can see the reason why she's at the level she is. I mean, she's she's just, just a physical specimen, and 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 uh, you can tell she's been putting in some serious hours, um, and and obviously getting the competition up and and, and playing. Because uh, again, sort of talking about some of the things that we saw there from a competition pathway perspective, um, definitely what I saw. I didn't hear as much in France, but I do know there's a lot of competitive opportunities. But in Spain and Italy, um, one thing they're doing very very well in the Italian Federation also is they're actually very very clear in their competition pathway. So. They're, they've got basically a, a system where if you're 11 years and under, you actually have to play green ball. They refuse to allow you to take part in competition unless you're actually on green ball and using a modified racket. So 26 inches and, and, and less. If you're a 27 inch racket, they actually have made it mandatory that you will, will not be able to play. And what they've then done is linked into their whole sort of red, like their, their competition pathway from the hot shots level. Um, so the kids were actually playing a lot more competitive matches um, from that pretty early, from that early age. From to me, the youngsters were sort of probably sixty to eighty matches um, to then up and above. Because again, there is access to a great um, sort of tournament pathway. So that whether it's a provincial level and then leading to again your ETAs, your European uh, events, to national levels, to ITFs, um, kids were playing probably two to three weekends per month. So. It's- so they're up there at sort of about 120 to 150 matches. Um, again, probably from an older age. So we're sort of talking 14, 15 and up um, yep. for some of those older ones. Yep. 
yeah interesting interesting that like the uk actually do this, do a similar thing where they uh have have everybody in the right ball color at a young age and that is the only way you could progress from say orange to green is if you get a pass if you win a bunch of events and get a passport other than that they uh they keep them in their age groups but uh yeah it, it, one of the challenges like with australia is that everyone's sort of chasing the next age group so everyone plays yellow at you know <laughs> seven seven and above if they're if they're good but it's not the idea not ideal i guess from a physical development or technical development perspective but we are we obviously have to deal with that um when it comes up but uh i mean any uh obviously you talked about the physical side there lots of lots of focus on on physical training um and uh any 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 sort of focuses that you saw on the psychological side and and uh how academies are are, are focusing in that space yeah and i think there's they're they're actually really strongly linked uh, because even sort of talking about the, the training side of things and again like i know um People sort of question the idea of going for long distance runs. Again, one of the, the Spanish and, and they go for 8K trail runs, getting young kids running 8Ks, they do it once per week. And they were talking about the idea of the benefit as, as an athlete is actually more so from a mental strength perspective rather than the athletic development you actually guess. Um, but but yeah, I mean, we, we did see obviously a lot of physical and mental development for kids is is that they were they were doing well. They they knew what they're working towards. Um just uh, I mean, again, physically, I felt like that was like so much stronger than a lot of our kids. Um, and again, a lot of it comes from the hour put in, but to me, the mentality too. I mean, going to the J500, of, uh, you, you sort of, of course, you'd see, um, you'd expect, I mean, those kids, the cutoff there is the sort of top 40 uh, ITS, the top 40, 50 players in the world. Um, they're tough. They're tough. And, and even a lot of the youngsters that we did see, um, you could see they've actually really tested and tried themselves in competition and, and, and basically understand the process too, because that's, that's probably a little bit off topic, but one of the things that I did see was with more of a greater focus on the long term, sort of the long term athletic development, sort of thinking big picture, rather than I know that's one of the things I often grapple with here is people want sort of the gains and the progress now, and unfortunately that's not typically the way it works. Um, but yeah, we definitely did see that sort of kids being 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 strong because uh, I mean again too so like tennis is a movement game, and I know to me we we obviously encourage that with what we do every day and trying to make kids move better. But it's just it's, it's everywhere. It hits you absolutely everywhere. It's it's constantly talked about. It's constantly referred to how how it's all about the legs, and and uh, yeah, we we see it because um, I'm not not sure if you've heard of a, of a sports psych who's done a little bit of work for the PA now it's called Jonah, uh, Jonah Rover, and sort of talking from that that mental and emotional perspective. I, I know it's one of the challenges I feel like we have. He he talks to the idea of, I mean, we're trying to create kids that can survive in the jungle, yet we're raising them in a zoo. But obviously, to me, it's one of the things that we do see here and how we parent um, and, and how, we, how we sort of try to, to ensure the kids um, are, are well taken care of. And obviously, we've got to take care of their, their well-being and make sure they're in a safe place. But I, I think that's where you see there's a lot more um, realism for, for the, difficulty, the difficulty of the journey. And that, that's why I spoke to the college pathway. Like, people understand that if you go to a high-level college, you've got to be real good. Like, you've actually got to really commit to, to, to the hours, to your body, to your mind. To your school link to actually achieve those yeah definitely and and um i guess for for parents or players on the call that that are wondering about the time commitments because a lot of people go to traditional schools and you may only have you know like i'd say a typical player national rank junior player might have after school 15 hours a week maybe maximum to dedicate to training so Kids that are in full-time academies, you know, you're saying they're doing 10 to 12, which is fine if you've got a really free schedule. But if you just had 15 hours a week of time, well, what would be your recommendation to, to breaking that from, from an on-court perspective, which we know is absolutely critical to, to physical training if, if you had to sort of guide parents around that? Yeah, it's, it's, it's actually, it's a really tough question. Because I know, I mean, it's something that, that again, we grapple with uh, with some of our access athletes that we're sort of trying to get into. That you still need to find ways to hit balls. Um, but ultimately, what you can and can't do on the court uh, with your body, with some, I mean, what you can and can't do with your body, with some, what you can and can't do on the court. But I, I think the first thing is really making sure you're focusing on prehab so you're actually staying healthy. Uh, that's, that's really an important one. I mean, for our younger athletes, making sure they're actually starting to learn correct movement patterns. I mean, again, even simple lunges, keep straight posture, like obviously engaging core, uh, and making sure everything's activated at glutes and making sure, I mean, I still think there is that, that thing, but I'd probably say in a 15 hour week, you'd, you'd want to still be at least, at least investing probably three or four hours on your body. 
Is it, but it's a really, it's a really tough one. Is that the kids start getting older and stronger and they start hitting ball better? You actually need to spend more and more time on your body. And it's just that, that balance. So it's a, it's a really hard, it's a really hard one. I mean, it does depend on the athlete as well. I mean, some kids, if they do struggle and they, 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 they need to, you probably invest more time uh, rather than hitting balls, but it's a compromise that you ideally not like to make. Yeah, it's like customized, right? So yeah, yeah. because I, I think that's the that's the thing. Like from a really young age, like actual physical training has less less of a effect on the on the body, you know, strength training and speed endurance and, and things like that. And as you get older, you can actually get gains. But I know the thing that Precision Athletic are our our partners sort of talk about all the time is like the number one goal of training is is actually you know preventing injuries and being able to play you know fifty two weeks of the year instead of instead of a lot less um, with injuries. So yeah, a lot of that time, I agree that, um, yeah, it, it, there needs to be a dedicated time each week to injury prevention or prehab, as it's called, um, is is super important. Um, sometimes I guess I see the error of, of people focusing a lot of time on actual, you know, fitness and, and strength training without getting a, you know, an actual, uh, an individualized sort of program that actually prevents injuries, number one, and then builds on on good, you know, athletic foundations after that. But uh, yeah, it's always a tough one. I, like a lot of our programming at some of at, at at our Voyager locations, we prioritize like almost all of the time on court because if someone only gets ten hours a week, then they need to do we've got 10, 10 hours on the court. But um, but yeah, it's it is a it is a tough one. But just a good perspective for for parents. So when you said ten to the ten to twelve hour number, I thought I you know like you still from a parent perspective, you still want to prioritize 80, 90, 80, 90% needs to be on court and 10 to 20% probably off court as a, as a general guide to, to consider. Yeah. But no, definitely. I think, I think Ryan too, it's probably a little bit of a segue, but it's again, a lot of the learnings too was um, not just the idea of seeing the academies, but some personal development work. And I know they talk about, um, Scott talks a lot about the high performance formula, which again, first of all, is about, about really aligning to your vision. And that's one of the things there where people say, hey, look, I want to play pro, I want to go to that high level college, which is great. And I think that's something I'd actually really encourage everyone to really think clearly about because what we then look at is well, what's the mindset required to achieve that vision? Because what we talk about, the mindset obviously determines your behaviors. And when you actually multiply that over time, okay, that's actually the outcomes that you get. And we can see how that works. And that's, again, sort of talking to, to me, one of the first things that struck me was just the amount of following the sheer volume of people that are actually all on that journey, that all are really sort of looking, hey, this is where I'm going, this is the journey. They've got an absolute laser focus and they're, and they're working towards it because that's where, again, I know it's, we're sort of talking about being time for and compromises. To me, what they found, they found a way to actually really commit early mornings. Like, again, a lot of them are up before sunlight, sunrise, and they're, they're putting in the hours, finishing school, eight, nine o'clock at night. So it was actually really impressive. Yeah, nice. 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 Um- all right, let's uh, let's uh, change uh, change the topics a little bit here, and we'll go into um, like the, I guess the coaches and observations. So, from a coach perspective, what were some of the observations you had around the type of coaches that were over there? Um, what were they looking to instill in their players? Any differences from what you see some of the best Australian coaches do? Yeah, any any uh, thoughts and observations around that? Yeah, it was actually it was really interesting. Um, <clears throat> Again, we, we were really fortunate to be exposed to, to some of the best. I mean, I mentioned Jose. I mean, Jose was fantastic. He had young Maddie Inglis, um, young Australian players who was, was about 110 WTA. She's sort of um, just sort of coming back in. She's been coming back off injury. He actually did some sessions with Maddie on court. Um, it reminded me so much of, of a lot of the coaches I'd worked with um, in, in Tony Roach and even for me, Kim Warwick, who was a huge part of, of, of my development. In the simplicity, it was so simple. It, it wasn't. It, it, it wasn't complicated. Um, I mean, for me, it was what you all often talk to, Ryan, as well, was actually reverse engineering of playing a match. And that's constantly what sort of um, Jose would talk to is, is how do we actually base this around playing the game and competing? And, and to me, that, that's what I loved. I mean, to me, the simplicity, the progression, progression, uh, again, the communication was, again, another, another thing that was really striking. Because those better coaches, they make it fun. Like even though they, they get you to work the house down, it was unbelievably engaged, un- unbelievably fun. Um, uh, but just the simplicity. And again, um, really lucky to have Tony Nadal spend a, a fair bit of time with us. And he, he literally <laughs> was hilarious. Ryan, you asked me about the sports side, side of things. Tony said, literally, I keep it simple and focus on the big things. And he talked about intensity. He said, hit it hard, hit it in. He was talking about the ability to deal with adversity. He talked about effort and ownership, or just simple things. And he said, literally, don't talk to me about nutrition. Don't talk to me about sports. Like, 
I want to focus. I don't want to focus on the one percent. And I know that sometimes what we can see as well, and I think it's a really interesting one for parents, is just coming back to, to again the absolute simplicity. I mean, Ricardo Piatti was there talking about technique, and, and his system's um, really well known. And literally, the first thing they do is they film you when you come in, and all he talks about was early preparation. I mean, grips, swing paths, simplicity, contact out the front, long follow throughs. Like it was, it was to me. Sometimes I feel like that's where in Australia we can actually overcoach. It's 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 one of the things that I see, and I know I know for me it's something that really resonates. I know in my coaching style, what I, what I try to do with kids is is make it so they don't really have to think about it. It's just something that happens naturally. But that was just a key theme that we saw from again an individual coaching style to even the philosophies of the academy. Is that that's one thing that I love was was visiting the various academies and just seeing what they actually truly believed in. And, and one thing I love because again improving it takes time. And if you're focusing on lots of different things all the time, you actually don't make many significant gains. And um, again, from Sanchez, where I know, Ryan, that was something that you brought back and it's still really strong in the academy. What we do and in how we set the tone is, is a lot of the Sanchez drills. It was, um, again, those Spanish drills was, again, they were absolutely, this is how we start every single session. Talking about the base, talking about your contact, talking about the idea of, again, driving out. I mean, it was really simple stuff. And to me, I think that's been a little bit of just basic fundamentals, um, which was which was unreal um, to see. Because I think sometimes we have the the habit too of of overcomplicating it. Yeah. One thing too, and again, which which I saw was quite interesting. A lot, a lot of the academies too, like obviously they've got a lot of coaches. Is sometimes too that the coaches they weren't necessarily that experienced, but they were passionate, they were enthusiastic, they were energetic, and they were obviously willing to learn. And that's why I sort of, for me, what I, what I really, what really resonated was just the environments to be in those environments, you've got motivated coaches, motivated people that are again, all working towards a common goal because the vision is very, very clear. It was, yeah, it was, it was, um, it was, yeah, it was, it was so such a good part, uh, such a good opportunity to see, to see that. I hope you handed out a few business cards to the coaches while you're over there, mate. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, a lot when it comes to Australia, that's for sure. And that's one of the things too, like in Europe, it's tough to get a job. That's one of the things that really sort of surprised me in, in how expensive a lot of the academies are. Like they're literally, the minimum of those academies was sort of four or five times the cost of obviously what, what we deliver. Um, but yeah, and the coaches, they don't pay too much. But um, no, it was, it, again, it's just the simplicity. Um, again, it was the belief in their methods in, in what they were doing. And um, yeah, it made, made me again sort of really, really sort of... Um, proud of what I do because I know again the Italian Federation one of the things that they've actually leaned into and leaned to really heavy is actually analytics and data and, and how they're using that with all their players um, and again that's what that's what sort of we're doing there with, with, our, with our partner at 135 Tennis Analytics is, is how we benchmark and track and measure all our players um, so again that's where again there's a lot of things where I felt like hey look we're actually on the right path and in, in that regard we're actually ahead of the majority of the academies because I actually only saw that at the Italian Federation and not used it in the academies but they're looking sort of dip their toe in that now yep yeah nice nice um guys uh i guess we're going to move into um q a um now so if anyone has any any questions um add it into the chat box beans and i in our last webinar had zero questions um so <laughs> if you uh if you want to uh want to ask a question or they came in at the, when we basically were wrapping it up so any questions guys add it in there um while, uh, while we give you guys a chance, yeah, one of the things I found really interesting about going to Sanchez Casal, probably more than any other venue that I've ever been to, is just how structured the drills were when I was when I was there. This is back in this is back twenty years ago, uh, eighteen years ago, and where they actually literally, I, I'm interested to know whether they are still like that. They literally had six core drills that they did every day with the players, and they had ratio, yeah, the same ratios but the same drills and they trained all their coaches on the six core, core baseline drills. And that was literally at every single session throughout the day, right from the morning, right the way through to the night you came in. And I don't think it really changed. I was there for two weeks and it never changed. Is it, is it actually still as structured as that or have they changed philosophies at all? Or what? It, it is. It's still the same. They talk about defense, neutral offense or attack as they were calling it. Um, it is exactly the same. Um, and again, I, I feel like it was, it was something that, that was, it was quite interesting because you'd see it from how committed the kids were to it. But one thing I thought as well is it, it almost 
for me, tennis is such a about decision making. Again, sort of Tony Nadal. One, one of the first things Tony sort of backtracking here a little bit talked about was the ability to problem solve. He actually felt like that was probably one of the most important factors for kids. And he actually said it's probably one of the areas that kids are starting to really deteriorate in. And, and again, to sort of lean back on that sort of the, the zoo and the jungle analogy, because often what we hear is parents are, are the GPS for their kids. They're directing where to go. And when the kids get out on the court, they actually get lost. And, and what I saw just then, again, the kids that are playing a lot and they're competing a lot, they can naturally figure it out, probably the better ones. But I, I really I really feel like that was probably uh, one of the things where there's some strengths to it. But you still want the, the kids to be able to really think clearly and obviously understand when to use what. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. Yeah, no, that, that philosophy was a really, really interesting one for, for me to see. Yeah, amazing they're still doing it. Um, yeah, they are. Because uh, because sometimes, obviously, academies, you know, change philosophies or freshen it up, but it sounds like they're, uh, they're, they're really... Um, there's, there's, there must be some strong-willed uh, directors in there, <laughs> maybe. You know, uh, um, all right, um, we've got a couple of questions in. Um, so we've got, uh, Brooke has said, uh, or asked, um, what uh, would one or two significant differences be between American and European academies? Yeah, good question. Um, in the States, we again, we were so fortunate in seeing going to IMG, going to Inspired Academy, uh, having a look at, uh, again, Altitude. A lot of the, the academies you probably wouldn't know, but Altitude was, is now run by the former IMG uh, director of, of 18 or 20 years. Um, so got to see some great things there. Um, I, I would say uh, the thing about the European academies too, again, and I can see it's sort of that question around the play courts, it was a big part of it, also the club uh, structure, is uh, I think in Europe, there's, there's more, of, more of a sort of that, that suffering mentality. And, I, and that might potentially have something to do with the play, but, but that's really a key driver that they talk about. To me, that's what I saw there. Is that, to me, the kids were a lot tougher in general, what I saw in Europe than the states and i think that's where the, the, the real sort of key thing around their philosophies again this is the same in the states the states were very very strong in what their philosophies were but to me what i saw in general was that same concept of, of kids being prepared to suffer and really do the hard yak and again there was some, don't get me wrong there's some really good players in the states there's some really hard work for kids but i think that was probably the, the one of the overarching things that we saw across all the academies was that that ability to really grit your teeth that sense of um, developing that 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 toughness and that grip you need to do to to, to actually grind out the win. That's that's a common theme. And again, for those that, that do know Europe, that is literally the Spanish system. It is about the ability to endure, about the ability to suffer. That's probably one of the things that I saw there as the kids. To me, were were were, were pretty tough um, from from what I did see. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Nice. And uh, another question coming in. Um, so clay courts are more common in Europe than Australia. Um, does that make a difference in young young players' developments? And an advantage there? Oh, I, I think it does. I mean, it definitely is a, a natural, I mean, there's some advantages there. We, we spoke to load. Um, and I think that's where in Europe, it, it, you are. You're, out, you're able to play more hours on court on clay. And that's the first thing. It's, it's softer on the joints. Um, it's easier on the body. Um, but but that's, that's where I think it's, it's an interesting too. Um, when you look at it, Ryan, you made that comment at the beginning that, that your coach is basically... Um, didn't particularly spend too much time on the clay when it's about getting results. Yeah. And, and, and I think, I mean, it, it definitely does help to have blocks, but even at Nadal's, that's actually, and again, I know the clay courts they have there is there's way more hard courts than clay courts. They're actually at the beginning, there wasn't even any clay courts at Nadal's. They actually all trained on hard, which I thought was, was quite interesting. Um, on the days we're there, we did see the clay courts being used because it was wet. And the indoor courts um, were the only ones being used. Um, but I do know they spent a lot of time there. But I, I definitely feel like it does. Again, talking to the idea of the, the patience that you need to develop the discipline. I mean, obviously, too, the movement side of things, like on clay, you've got to really make sure you load up. Um, you've got to be balanced. Um, again, the mental the mental sort of uh, side of things you need. So I definitely feel like there is. But I, I do hear this a lot. Um, Ryan, and again, that's why I sort of bring that up there is because I, I look at it, I see a lot of Aussies and I think it's good to go and get to sort of wet your teeth. But one of the things we have a lot of our academy kids go over, um, they have gone over. And one of the things they sort of said when they've come back is they actually speak to what we do, the level of what we deliver, our coaches, expertise and knowledge. But from a training perspective, it's not the training side of things. For me, if I was going to attend a kid to Europe, yeah, I might go to an academy for a week or two to a long time. But then for me, it's about competing. It'll actually be about going to play the tournaments. Because... If, if we look at it, 
from a results perspective. Um, our competitive advantage is not being a great play quarter. Like, Orion, I'll ask you that. Who, who, who would you perceive or who would you think is our best play quarter in the last 20 years? Yeah, I mean, you typically, you typically don't get, you know, developed clay quarters from, from Australia. Um, I mean, I don't, I don't know the last time we made a, someone, an Aussie male player made a quarter of, of Roland Garros. I mean, you might be able to tell me, tell me who well, that Ash, is. Ash, but... Ash Barty. I mean, to be Ash Barty, obviously, a French Open champ. She's, she's the, the standout, but Ash is, Ash, yep. Ash is unique. Like, she's so yep. amazing. And I think it's really hard to sort of put a generational play like that. But you look at it, typically Aussies, we actually minimize our time of play like through that. And again, as pros, you obviously can pick your schedules and it happens. Um, where, yeah, where it's, this- it's, it, it is a really, it's a really good point. I mean, you just develop d- different game styles, you know, the players coming out of the U S they're playing on faster hard courts. They're going to be, pl- there's more all court players. There's a couple of serve volleyers in there, you know, that or aggressive baseline as you don't yeah. typically see counter punches coming out of the U S um, uh, or, or Australia for that matter, where a lot of people grow up on synthetic grass or hard court. So it just tends to produce a different style of play. I mean, Europe, there's a lot of indoors, I guess, and a lot of hard courts. So it's not like you, you do see a lot of crafty, uh, aggressive players coming out of Europe. It's probably more South America where it's a lot more clay that you typically see the, 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 uh, the grinders coming out of there. But um, yeah, it's, I, I think it's a, I think it's a good question around clay or not. I do think it's, it's easier on the body. That's probably, mm-hmm. as you say, that's probably the main benefit, but besides that, it depends on the style you play. I mean, one of the issues that I always found um, growing up on say synthetic grass or hard court is that, well, it shouldn't be an issue, but you know, typically when you go and play overseas, so say that using the four grand slams as an, as an example, really well, Australians really well suited to the Australian open, the U S open and Wimbledon. We, we liked those three events. The French Open was was almost a really difficult event to do well in because you're competing against all the South Americans that grow up on clay and all the Europeans that spend lots of time on clay, the ones that do um, anyway, and it feels like a different game. So it's so it's just, that's just the reality. You're still really well suited to most surfaces by growing up on hard or seeing grass or, or, or a little bit of clay here or there, but um, yeah, you end up, you know, and, and I think as a, as a, once you start to, I mean, for, for a professional player, as you know, then you just avoid playing on the surfaces you don't like. If you're a great grinder and you grow up on clay, you'll, you'll pick a clay court, um, so, you know, a season, or, you know, a tournament calendar versus, you know, a lot of Australians won't typically play very much on clay at all when you've got the choice. Um, and I know US college is probably where most of our players are heading. It's fast. So you actually want to have at least, you know, an aggressive baseline or, or, or an all court sort of game going into going into you at the US college system. If you go in there and you've just been on clay the whole time, then you're probably going to be at a disadvantage and not perform as well. So um, yeah, it's uh it's definitely uh there's definitely a lot, yeah, of, a lot of debate around it. There is, there is because I think for me, my advice is always if you want to be a high level player, you got to, you gotta have a point of difference. And if you're gonna get out there and be three meters behind the baseline and grind like a lot of these kids that have been doing from day dot, it's it's actually to me it's it's um it's really, really challenging. And I think our competitive advantage, um, maybe it's a cultural shift as well. It's always been based around the serve. From going back to players like Alicia Mollick, I mean, even Sam Stoza, on the, even on the WTA tour. And then, and then you look at um, an Ash Barty or even Astra Sharma. It's it's all big names based all around the serve. Casey Delac. Well, I mean, our players have actually broken the top 100 because we've only, I think only had two in the top 100 in the last 10 years. I mean, because I'd, I'd point to this, the Spanish women. I mean, outside of Bedosa and to who is it? Um, Rebecca um, Cover, I think her name is as well, who's about 65 in the world. They actually don't have too many females that are breaking through because I think that's, again, always encourage people to go and have a look and get a taste. But if you're trying to compete on their, on their territory, to me, it's, it's, it's not the way forward. And that's where you look at all the Americans that are coming through. I mean, I mentioned Claire V. Amigui, who was there in that young $16, $5.30 WTA already. She, I saw her fall over on the court. Like you could watch her play. Like she didn't have the ability to actually slide into the shot. She was basically stumbling around the court. She made the, uh, the semis of that event. But I, I just know for her, you could see it as a pro. She's going to basically schedule everything around everything else. I mean, you, you can have fast court players. And again, her game's based around the serve and aggressive game style, like we talked about. But I definitely feel like there are some, some, some benefits. But to me, it's about you. It's about your game style. It's about your point of difference. And I just feel like, again, even a, a, people often say, Alex Diminar, hey, he's our best play quarter. He, he tries to avoid it as much as he can. His game <laughs> yeah. style, he sits the ball yeah. so flat. He needs fast, thick courts. And I know people say, hey, yeah, we grew up in Spain. I mean, to me, Moro 
most of the kids are on hard court. Like all those, they're all on hard. There was only a handful of clay courts. Again, the dials, it, it comes back to you and your needs. Yeah, that makes uh, completely makes sense. So, um, question uh, follow up question here is: uh, any are there any advantages that you see for learning to play tennis in Australia compared to Europe? Well, in Australia, I mean, I, I think to me, the advantages are you're at home. You 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 get to to be around. I mean, it's again, it's a really simplistic one, but to me, I mean, again, Ash Barty talked to Ash. One of the reasons why she was sort of stopped playing at seventeen was she got sick of travelling. She'd been traveling for the world since she was 12. I mean, Australia's produced so many players. And again, we're still going to be quite well, considering the size of our population, the actual amount of people who play tennis. Um, I would say the competitive advantage that we have is, is, again, is if you play fast. And that's why my kids are playing now. I know it's on court with some of the, the, the girls that are her age. And to me, the competitive advantage that I know is based around the serve. So we've done tons of throwing work. Um, that is that is the area, again, I've, I'm trying to encourage my students to play fast, to actually take the ball on the rise like all the best players do. Um, again, to me, that can be an advantage to have that point of difference as long as you have the skill set to actually execute at a really high level. Um, but again, from Europe, to me, there's some great advantages as well. Like obviously, if you do grow up on the play and you do have access to it 24-7, fantastic. There's obviously a great base for you. Um, to me, again, the competition is, is really strong. Having so many countries that are so closely uh, Tied together. I mean, I think we're in, uh, again at Piatti, one of the coaches talking to what their, their philosophy is, where they'll go out and play. Um, and again, you can go 45 minutes to an hour and a half, two hours, and you could probably be in three or four different countries where they can. They're back home that afternoon and they're back on the practice court. So that to me is probably more, more what I do see is the competition. But if you have the opportunity and you've got the means as a young kid, um, I, I'd highly encourage you to go over, but not necessarily to visit the academy. It's, it's not about the academy because, again, speaking to the academies, uh, the academy model is what I saw is not all kids got the same service. Some of those bigger academies, they're actually paying for those better kids. They actually sponsor them. They bring them into under, the, under their management system and they basically look to, to recoup the, the money, the future earnings, and they actually have a different program. And that was one of the things that I did see there with a lot of their targeted kids. So there was almost two different elements. And, at one of those major academies, um, which was our tour guide, was actually one of my uh, one of my colleagues from back in the day who I used to play on tour with for, for twelve years. So he actually gave the true insights on, hey, this is what we actually do. This is the model. We, we love having these great kids, and then drawing the girls in, which to me is fantastic. But um, to, to me, there it's it's uh, definitely advantages. But I, I still feel like as an Aussie, if you're going to go 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 for a taste, go and get some matches under, go and go and see the level, and then come back and work your butt so you can actually be ready to hit the ground running. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I suppose just to follow on from that, like it's uh, Australia is one of the best tennis nations in the world to be living in. If you want to be a professional player or, or a very high level player, the training environments, I'd say, in our, all of our major capital cities are, are really, really good. I mean, we've, you know, Luke and I've been fortunate enough to spend time in a lot of different countries playing tennis. And I'd say 90% of them, uh, you know, have no funding, you know, very little funding from the Federation. Very, you know, there's a lot of countries that have very little, you know, uh, way uh, in the way of tournaments or competitions or you know environments like that. So it, it is something that I that I've every every time I've travelled to different countries, I always think, you know, there's countries like Singapore, for example. I know there might be some people on the call um, from Singapore, but there's there's very few tournaments there. There's very few really good training environments to choose from, and so that is that is something that I think a, a lot of Australian players are. Are very fortunate about you're literally one of the best countries in the like for per for, per um for, for the population that we have like we must be ranked in the top three in the world for producing players like i don't know that's there's probably a stat on that but it's it's it has to be right up there um and uh yeah and and the only thing that i think players miss and this is this is what you you would have got as a junior and what i got as a junior is this just exposure internationally to compete so i i don't think i ever went overseas to train as a player. I always went overseas yeah. to, to compete and literally test your game up against the other best players in Europe or the United States or South America um, did tours across all of those, those places. Cause at the end of the day, you want to test, test your game under competition. Um, uh, not to say it's, yeah, as I said, I think it's really valuable to do, to do training blocks if you're over there for an extended period of time um, to, to do it. But uh, yeah, it's the competition that, that Australian players um, that get to a really high standard need to, need to go overseas and, and experience um, that against other other players. So um, 
Um, guys, we've uh, we've got to the uh, to the end of the uh, the webinar now. Um, uh, appreciate uh, all of your um, questions there. Um, apologies for missing the last uh, last couple there. But we've just run out of time. Um, yeah, mate, it sounds, it sounds like a, obviously a really a really great trip. Some really good good learnings out of it. I guess some things for parents um, and and players to consider who are on the call is just around that. Uh, I think that training volume is 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 really really critical and sort of came through. That's why a lot of academies are set up to try and get the hours up and compete a lot. Um, the focus on the physical development side is is obviously a really a really key one. Without being healthy and uh, and that it's going to be hard. And I suppose the other key message was just around the um, the education side is obviously a really critical part for for players because uh, yeah, very very few players are going to make it professionally. But a lot of players can get a great education out of tennis as long as you get the balance right. You want to try and play. Colleges are typically looking for really really high level players that are good academically. Um, and so if, if parents can and players can find that balance, I guess you can end up, you know, going to amazing colleges, having a crack at the pro circuit, if that's the, the, the way you want, or just get a great, a great degree and, and uh, enter the workforce and continue playing tennis for the rest of your life. So, and enjoying it. So um, some really good messages in there, mate. Um, thanks. Thanks so much for your time. Um, and uh, yeah, appreciate it. And we'll, we'll, uh, feel we'll do it again soon. We'll let everyone know about it. Yeah, absolute pleasure. Thanks, Ryan. Thanks, everyone. All right. Thanks a lot, guys.